Hello and welcome to my A Silent Voice review. A couple things before I get started. First, it's thunderstorm season where I live. Uh, I got up early to record so it wouldn't be raining and storming, but it looks like it's going to rain and storm early anyway, so if you hear rain or thunder in the background, I'm sorry. Uh, secondly, my throat hurts. I don't know if I'm getting sick or if it's because I woke up early, I'm drinking tea, I'm trying to make it better, but if my voice breaks or gets all hoarse throughout the video, please forgive, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, moving on to the review. Uh, the animation was very good. There's lots of personality in the character designs, but within a slice of life world. And what I mean by that is, in a lot of shows you can tell things about the characters by their extreme outfits and hairstyles, but this is done very subtly here. For example, our, our main character Ishida always has a tag sticking out on the back of his shirt, and it drove me crazy for a lot of the movie, but it establishes that this character doesn't really care all that much about his appearance, and that's character design storytelling. Um, the music is pretty good, there's no particularly outstanding tracks, but it is emotionally impactful when it needs to be, and overall, kind of just, you know, pleasant. <laughs> uh, now on to the story. The story begins in elementary school, when a deaf girl, Nishmiya, moves into the elementary school of our main character, Ishida. She begins being bullied by many students for her deafness. Ishida is just the most physical of the bullies. He frequently steals and destroys her hearing aids. This continues until one day he pulls them out of her ears and it cuts her. Her mother called the school and Ishida gets called out for his bullying, but he projects the blame to other students who, while guilty, turn on him to avoid taking any blame for themselves. He starts being bullied by the other students, but Nishmiya is always very kind to him. Eventually, she leaves the school because of the bullying. Ishida grows up isolated and alone, and he decides to commit suicide. Quick, suicide is never the answer, and the National Suicide Hotline will be in the description. Uh, but before he decides to kill himself, he wants to make amends to Nishmiya. I'm not actually sure whether he runs into her on purpose or on accident, but I think it was on purpose because he was carrying with him a notebook that she used to use to communicate. Either way, he asks her if they can be friends, and he decides to see her again. They end up talking and feeding the koi uh, on the bridge over the river, which becomes a routine for them. Honestly, it's a Herculean task to try and make this truly and honestly awful kid into a likable character. But this movie does it so right. This character did horrible things and suffered for it in a very parallel way to how he made Nishmiya suffer. He's still being affected by it years later. He's been forced to remain isolated. He's so consumed with his guilt and loneliness that he believes the world has no place for him anymore. It's clear that what he did was on his mind for years. He even learned sign language. What's more important with how this is presented is that it's arguable that this character deserves this, but he's growing. He's getting karmic retribution for hurting someone who didn't deserve to be hurt. Something I really like about the imagery of the guilt and isolation is that most of the people Ishida sees have big paper sticker X's over their faces when seen from his perspective, which is really visually pleasing too. As he gets to know them, faces the possibility of rejection, accepts them, and is accepted in return, the X falls from their face and they're able to look each other in the eye. It's a fascinating exploration on the intensity with which we feel guilt. When we have done something wrong, we are rejected by others. If this happens for long enough, we eventually end up avoiding the possibility of that rejection by avoiding connection. But in a similarly interesting parallel, the isolation that Ishida feels because of his own actions is the same isolation that Nishimiya feels because of her deafness. But in connecting with each other, they're both able to branch out. The first connection that Ishida makes outside his family is Nagatsuka. He's getting his bike stolen and Ishida is forced to intervene. He engages with the world for the first time in a very long time, even though he's scared, and he sacrifices his bike for it. This interaction prepares him for greater connection and greater sacrifice in the future and gives him an outlet to learn about what it means to be a friend again. They reconnect with many of their classmates, including Kwai, a girl who was an outright mean but was a bit of a gossip, Saihara, 
a girl who was trying to be a friend, even learning sign language, but was driven away when she was too cowardly to stand up to bullies, and Yuno, probably the second most intense bully after Ishida. Yuno has a particular distaste for Nishimiya, even going so far as to try and ruin her friendships with everyone else. I think something interesting that Yuno provides is a look at how Ishida could have turned out if he didn't suffer the way he did. She's not the most well-developed character, but from what we do see, she seems content, simply bullying Nishmiya because she's deaf and it's fun. Yuno suffered little to no consequences for her actions, and therefore did not examine them, change, or grow. The other classmates are similarly enablers of the bullying environment, and in fact haven't changed very much over the years because they were able to avoid the consequences of their actions shift the blame to the main bully Ishida, and the deaf girl leaves not too long after. The most innocent of them all is Sahara, who tried to be a friend, but ultimately was unable to handle the criticism that came her way for being friendly with Nishimiya. She's also one of the only other characters actively trying to change. She wants to become more brave. She realized that she has a flaw, and she wants to work on it. Kwai is in denial. She believes that her gossiping with the other students about Nishimiya was harmless, and she refuses to acknowledge that she could possibly be a bully. These characters are mostly trying to ignore the underlying tensions they feel, but that guilt is still there, and it unintentionally taints all the actions they have with Nishimiya. It comes to a head when Ishida, feeling hurt, calls them out harshly and forces them to actually face the reality of their actions and the consequences for what they did within the context of their present relationships. Within this same lash-out, he attacks his new friend Nagatsuka because he feels he doesn't deserve to be defended, and newcomer Mashiba as well, for becoming part of something he doesn't really understand. I'm going to interject with a quick note about the pacing. This feels like the climax of the movie, but isn't. This movie is pretty long, about 2 hours and 10 minutes, and the pacing is a little strange, but the pacing issues I've seen are similar to pacing issues I've had with anime in the past. This makes me wonder if I'm trying to measure Japanese media against Western media standards, and therefore, I'll give it a pass. After Ishida attacks the others on the bridge, um, emotionally attacks, not physically, he and Nishmi are still hanging out, but something about it feels off. Something about his character feels really forced and too positive, and it made me very, very concerned for where his head was at. Um, but one of the most fascinating characters in the story is Nishimiya herself. She arguably has the most to say, but says the least. She very clearly worries that she's a burden. She apologizes all the time for things that are not her fault, takes any abuse thrown at her without complaint, and is extremely quick to forgive those who have hurt her. I'm not deaf, so I don't know how deaf people feel. But at least within the context of this story, I think that Nishimiya feels guilty for the simple fact that she is deaf. She's worried that she'll slow people down, or that they'll get tired of her, but she's not explicit about any of this information. Later in the story, Nishimiya tells Ishida that she's leaving early from a festival to study. Her little sister asks Ishida to go to their house and get her camera so she can take some pictures at the festival. The little sister is a really interesting character on her own. She's a photographer who mostly shoots dead animals and is very protective of her older sister. But I don't really have time to go into all the details of the sister. She's just really fun. So Ishida walks to their home and sees Nishimiya standing on the edge of the balcony about to jump. This scene is amazing. Ishida is clearly desperate to save her, and it really shows in the animation. It's actually kind of indescribable, and I can't really recommend this movie highly enough. It's really intense. He catches her and begs for her to grab the ledge to pull herself up. However, in helping her, he overbalances and falls off the building. He sacrifices himself to save her. He ends up comatose, and it's revealed that Yuzu took photos of dead animals to get her sister to stop saying she wanted to die. It kind of comes out of nowhere that Nishmiya is suicidal, but it's not really surprising if you think about it. The character is so kind and forgiving that her pain lies entirely below the surface. She struggles, but is quiet, so to the world her suffering is totally invisible. The sacrifice Ishida makes for her is a completion of both of their character arcs. She experiences the feeling that someone loves her so much to lay down their life for her. She had her mother and sister before, 
but living a generally isolated life left her feeling ununderstandable. But knowing there were people around her who were willing to learn, change, and grow for her gives her a new perspective. It's a powerful completion of Ishida's character arc, from suicidal to wanting to live, from torment to guilt to a repayment of debt. Until this moment, he could never truly be friends with Nishimiya as an equal, because he owed her so much. But with his debt finally repaid, they have a moment on the bridge where they feed the koi of really pure connection. For people that have each been struggling to connect for quite a while, it really goes deeper than something romantic. They aren't ready for romance, and the movie acknowledges this. They clearly like each other, but they have a lot of learning and healing to do first. Ishida wakes up to all of his friends, wishing him well, acknowledging that he hurt them, but willing to forgive him, which is another really crucial thing to him. In his experience, if you do something wrong, no one really likes you anymore. Again, I'm not saying he didn't deserve the ridicule, it's just that the impact of what he did would have stuck with him for a very, very long time. However, these friends show him that they're willing to forgive, and that his guilt doesn't have to keep eating him up forever. There's a really lovely scene at the end, where Ishida finally opens himself up to connection with the world. The paper X's fall from everyone's faces, he listens and hears not judgement of him, but just people having conversations, and he's overwhelmed by the fact that there are so many things he had been afraid of, but with people who love him and accept him, he's finally able to move on from his past. I really, really liked this movie. It had complex themes, complete character arcs, and a truly relatable message about how guilt can change how we connect. <laughs> What's that kind of crappy quote again? We accept the love we think we deserve. I wish I could say that in a less cheesy way, but that's basically the overall theme of this movie. Guilt prevents us from accepting love, and when we don't accept love, we can't give love because there's no connection between people. Overall, 9.5 koi fish out of 10. Thanks for watching and have a lovely day and all that jazz. <laughs>